Go ahead and take a seat. Um, as you're doing so, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 19. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1 of Luke 19. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, there are some Bibles underneath some of the chairs. Feel free to grab one. If you don't have a Bible at your home, take that Bible home with you. We want every person who steps into this sanctuary, this worship center, to have a Bible at home. And so please, please feel free to take that home with you. Now, I've always been short. I have. I know that you look up here and you go, but Chad, you don't look that short. The stage adds 10 inches, or is it the camera adds 10 pounds? I never can remember, but I have always been a short person. As a matter of fact, I was the shortest person in my school class of all my classmates in my grade level. I was the shortest person uh, until sometime between the freshman and sophomore year of high school. Uh, when I came into my sophomore year, I was starting football and had to take a physical exam. And in my physical, they did my height and weight. And my height, I had finally broken my sophomore year, the five foot barrier. I was five foot zero and 114 pounds. And it was at that point that I was no longer the shortest person in my class. I had exceeded Corinne Gallegos by an inch and a half. And it was one of the happiest days of my life. Now, again, it, up here on stage, I'm a solid probably four feet above you right now. And so I do maybe look a little taller. But I don't know if you've noticed, when Pastor Chad preaches, he has this big podium that stands here. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever wondered why I don't use that podium? <laughs> It's not because I prefer my technology. I can sit, a, sit my tablet on that podium just as well as I can have it on this stand right here. This podium would swallow me whole. The people in the first four rows wouldn't be able to see anything from this down because I'm that short. Um, I, I, I like to joke about it, but the reason I'm mentioning this is uh, if you look in Luke 19, verses 1 through 10... We're going to be looking at a passage about a man named Zacchaeus. Anybody of you remember the old little VBS church camp song about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little... That's me. Through and through. If Jesus was coming through my town, I'd have to climb a tree to see him. Guaranteed. And so I've had a love-hate relationship with this story because it's not like I was proud of my shortness and that I enjoyed being proud. I always wanted to be the, you know, five foot eight guy. <laughs> wow, that's really tall. I've always wanted to be the bigger guy and never have been. So I've had a love-hate relationship with Luke 19 because it's about a man. The account is about a man who lived and we're taught as kids that the, the defining point of this account is that he was a short guy. And so when I would go to VBS or church camp and this song was sung, everybody turned and looked at me because I was the short guy in the pew or in the room or whatever. Now, as I've grown up and as I've studied God's word, I've realized that the story of Zacchaeus has almost nothing to do with his height or lack thereof. The story of Zacchaeus is about life change. And so I went from having a love-hate relationship with this story to really loving this story. This story, this account in Jesus' life is actually one of my more favorite accounts because it is one of the more clear, more immediate life change accounts uh, that you're going to find in God's Word. And so let's take our Bibles, look at Luke 19. We're going to start in verse 1 and let's read what happens here. And it says, he, meaning Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. Now, stop there. Uh, we've been talking about this a lot. We've been going through the book of Luke, and every time that we come to an account where it mentions a tax collector, we stop here and explain what this means, because it's important for us understanding what's happening here to understand that he was a tax collector, because a tax collector was the most hated of all the people in Israel. They were usually Jewish people who had become traitors of their land and started serving the Roman government who was basically oppressing, ruling over the Jews. And so the tax collectors were taking, were, were Jewish people who were collecting Roman taxes. 
And not only that, they would collect whatever money the Romans said they needed to collect from each household, and then they would collect a little extra to put in their pocket. And so Zacchaeus in the city of Jericho was a hated man. Uh, Usually when Jesus talks about the tax collectors, he says a phrase, the tax collectors and chief sinners, something along that line. Tax collectors were usually the lowest of the low, but they were also the big partiers, the people who had no interest in serving God, had no interest in religion, had no interest in having a relationship with their Savior. They didn't care about God at all. And so that's important here that Zacchaeus was not a God follower. He was not someone who loved the Lord. And he was a tax collector, which had made him very rich. So look at verse 3. And he was seeking to see Jesus, who, uh, who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass by. Okay, now... Think about it for just a second. Have you ever been to a parade? You go to a parade and you watch everything pass by. That's kind of the energy that we would have been seeing here in the city of Jericho. Jesus and all of his followers are coming through the city, and Jesus is probably waving and welcoming and shaking hands and and showing appreciation to the people, and the people have lined the streets to see Jesus. They just want to get a glimpse of this famous teacher that everybody's been talking about. And here's a guy who everybody pretty much universally hates in the city. And you look up and he's climbed a tree so that he can see the passing procession. This is not something that he's doing to gain honor, is he? I mean, if if you were in this situation and you were watching Jesus pass by and you looked up and saw Zacchaeus, the guy that everybody in town hates, are you thinking, oh, how wonderful, he climbed a tree to see the Savior? No, no. You're thinking, what a moron. Look at that loser climbing the tree. You're, you're going to assume the worst about Zacchaeus because everybody assumed the worst about Zacchaeus because of who he was. So let's continue going. Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, in other words, the place where the sycamore tree was, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Stop for a second. What did I just say about what everybody was thinking about Zacchaeus? He's a moron. What a loser, that sinner that every one of us hates. He's climbed that stupid tree, and he's trying to see Jesus, and what's going to happen? And then the person that everybody has gathered to see calls it out and goes, Zacchaeus, come down. I need to stay at your place today. Can you imagine what you would have thought if you were a person standing in the crowd. Talk about confused, right? So let's keep going. Verse 6, So he hurried down and came down and received him joyfully. He received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, The half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Amazing account, right? Uh, I can't imagine just being there watching this because it's the opposite thing that everybody expected Jesus to do. No reputable religious teacher would call out a sinner and ask him to go stay at his house. That would have never happened. But this story, as amazing as it is, it does bring a question to us that we need to get answered and clarified. And it's simply this. What is salvation? What is salvation? We throw around this word salvation in church and in uh, life groups and things like that all the time, but what does it mean? Uh, What does it mean to be saved? Well, if I was to say that I got saved from drowning, that's pretty easy to understand, right? 
I was in a situation where I was going to die unless someone intervened, and someone did, correct? Someone saved me. That's the same connotation here. That's exactly what we're saying. So verse 9, why we have to answer this question. It says, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. So let me ask this. In trying to figure out exactly what salvation is, is salvation something that we do? No. Is salvation a prayer that we pray? You know, how many of us in this room, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of us in this room can go back and maybe not name a date or whatever, but you can remember a time where you prayed a prayer to receive Christ? Is that what saved you? Is that what saved me as I sat down one day at a church camp and I prayed with some counselor that I don't remember what his name was now and prayed a prayer to receive Jesus? Is that what saved me? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, you will not find anywhere in the Bible where it commands us to pray a prayer to get saved. And I'll come back to that in a second. So let me ask you this. Does coming to church on the weekend, does that save us? No. Guys, you can stand in your garage all you want. It doesn't make you a car. (laughs) It's true, right? You can sit in this room all you want. You can be here every Saturday night without fail. Does that make you a follower of Christ? No. Salvation is not about praying a prayer. It's not about attending church regularly on a weekend. Here's the hard one. Do we receive salvation? Can we be saved by being good, by doing good things? No. And guys, the reason I'm talking about this specifically and kind of putting a little focus on it is this is the number one misconception about what it takes to get into heaven. See, when I talk about salvation and I talk about being saved, we're being saved from spending an eternity in hell, and instead we're being saved into heaven. Being a good person does not do that. You could do all of the good deeds on the face of the planet for a million lifetimes, and that would not be enough to get you into heaven. Because it's not about the good things you do, it's about the fact that we are criminals in the eyes of God because we have broken his law. And as criminals, what do we deserve? Punishment. Salvation is not about doing good things or being a good person. It has nothing to do with that. But what is salvation? I've I've told you what it's not, but what is it? It's simply this. It is a life-changing relationship. Salvation is simply a life-changing relationship. It's not about what we do, but who we know, to put it simply. It's about having a relationship with someone who has the authority to get us out of hell and take us into heaven. We don't deserve heaven. We've done nothing to deserve heaven. As a matter of fact, most of us in this room not most of us, pretty much all of us in this room have sinned, have broken God's laws multiple times in the last hour, right? We don't deserve heaven. We deserve punishment because we continually break God's law. If someone broke into your house and stole all your things and beat you up so bad that you had to be in the hospital, would you want that person to go scot-free or would you want that person to see some jail time and some punishment? You'd want that person to see punishment. Guys, we're the criminals. We're the ones in need of being made innocent here. We're not the ones who deserve. We're not the good law-abiding citizens. We're the ones who broke the law. But when we step into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, instead of receiving that punishment on ourselves, Jesus takes it on himself. And he goes before the judge and he says, Judge, this person is innocent because of my sacrifice. I paid the price for his wrongdoing. So he goes free. He goes to heaven. That's what it means to be saved. Jesus saves us from the punishment that we rightly deserve. And as we know him, our lives will change to look more like him. 
And that's a key here. We have to be looking more like him. In verse 8, it tells about how Zacchaeus stepped into a relationship with Jesus in a blink of an eye and totally changed his life, didn't he? He took all of his riches and laid it out and said, Jesus, I'm going to give back anything that I've defrauded fourfold. I'm going to donate everything I have or half of what I own. I'm going to give it to the poor. He took what was most dear to him, his money, and he laid it on the line and changed everything about his life in one moment because of a relationship. So salvation is a life-changing relationship, but how should this relationship change our lives. How should this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, how should it affect us? How should it change our lives? Now, I've said that what we do, in other words, our works, because that's another Bible word that uh, you don't throw around in everyday conversation all the time. When the Bible says your works do not save you, uh, the Bible is talking about the things you do don't save you. The prayer, attending church, giving things away, those things don't save you. But the works are still important. And let me explain why for a second. If you claim to be a follower of Christ, but your life has not changed at all from before you knew Christ, something's wrong. Something's not clicking correctly. James actually tells us, if you go read in James chapter 2, James tells us that works are the result of our relationship. So if you take... OC, Chad, that's me. If you take me and you add a relationship with Jesus Christ and put an equal sign in there, then the last thing, what it equates to, is a change in my life. It is the automatic given result of Jesus coming into your life. It's a changed life, works. So let me put it in a totally different illustration. I'm not a very good smelling guy. I take a couple of showers a day and I use cologne and things like that because I just emanate. I, I, it is not uncommon for me to come home from a day at work and sit down. Guys, I don't do anything like super laborious. I'm a pastor. I mean, I barely work during the week anyways, but that's a joke. Come on, people. Jeez. But... After a day's work, I can come home and I can sit down to my wife and it's not uncommon for my wife to lean back a little bit from me and go, babe, you need to go take a shower. Because I smell. I'll, I'll lay that out on the line. That's probably the most embarrassing, transparent thing I've ever said from this stage. But if I go in and I take a shower and I come back out and I sit down and my wife still does this, leans away from me and goes, babe, what happened? You didn't take a shower. No, I totally took a shower. Turned the water on, hopped in. That's taking a shower, right? If I come back out to my wife and I still smell just as bad as I did before I took my shower, then I'm doing something wrong, right? Either I didn't get under the water at all or maybe I didn't understand that I needed to grab the bar of soap that's on the shelf and rub it on me because that helps. <laughs> I don't know what it is that I may have done wrong, but if I walk in to my wife after taking the shower and I still smell, I did something wrong. If you claim to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ and your life has not changed, something's not right something's wrong. Because when you add your life and a relationship with Jesus, your life should look different. It should be a resulting process. The works don't save you. The changes don't save you. It's just when you get saved, when you begin that relationship with Jesus, the end result is change. You see, our relationship with Jesus cleanses and changes us. And so if we're not cleansed and we're not changed, then either we haven't started a relationship really with Jesus, it's not, we didn't really do it, or we, we have a misunderstanding of what our lives should look like through Jesus Christ and through his spirit. And so we have to understand these things. So if we want a changed life in Jesus, what do we do? 
Well, the first part is very simple. We simply respond to Jesus. Respond to Jesus. Think about what Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus encounters Jesus. Jesus asks him to come down, tells him, I'm going to stay at your place today. And Zacchaeus immediately in the moment, without blinking an eye, responds, doesn't he? He changes his life because of his encounter with Christ. He changes it in that very moment. So here's the hard part, guys. Has your life changed? Let me be a little more specific here. Has your anger and your outbursts of anger, because anger itself is not a sin, it's how you deal with your anger. Uh, If you go read Galatians 5, it talks about some of the uh, acts of the flesh, sinful things, and it, it lists outbursts of anger. Have you taken your anger and through a relationship of G- with Jesus, have you changed that anger to love and peace? Because guys, let me be honest in here. If I was to you know, put a secret camera in your houses, how many of you would not feel too good about what I saw because of your anger? Your relationship with Jesus Christ needs to be changing that. That's one of the biggest things that Christ changed in my own life was I used to be a very, very angry person. And Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, changed that. But I had to be willing to say, God, I recognize that I'm an angry person. I realize that my outbursts of anger do not please you and they're not part of what you want. And I need you to help me change this. And God helped me change it. Here's another one. Has your relationship with Jesus taken your jealousy and converted it, changed it into contentment and satisfaction in your life? Because let's be honest, again, if I was to have a secret camera or was able to mic you without you knowing and I heard everything you said, would some of you be embarrassed about the jealousy that you struggle with? God wants to change that in your life. God wants to take that jealousy and this, that discontentment and he wants to convert it. He wants to change it through his spirit into contentment, into peace, into satisfaction with your life. What about greed? Has a relationship with Jesus Christ converted your greed into generosity? Because that's what Christ calls us to do. If we're called to be a follower of Christ, then we're supposed to be generous with those around us. We're supposed to give our time and our resources to help those who need some of our time and resources. But are you still a greedy person? In other words, do you see a need out there that God has clearly given you the ability to affect and you've ignored that need? That's greed. God wants you to be generous. It doesn't mean that you have to give every penny away, but it does mean that you're supposed to sacrifice a little of your time and your resources, money or, or whatever, to, to help those who might need some help. What about sexual temptations? I know some of us in this room struggle with sexual temptation. Has your relationship with Jesus spurred you on to fight against that sexual temptation so that you can live a life of purity? Have you had the desire in your heart to say, God, I want to be more obedient to what your word says about what I'm supposed to do sexually? And have you changed that in your life or taken steps to, to be more pure? Here's the big one that probably, if you were to take this one thing, it probably applies to everything else. And it's simply this. Through a relationship with Christ, have you changed, or has God changed in you, you from being selfish to selfless? Because, guys, that's a big part of what it means to be a follower of Christ, is to, we don't live for ourselves anymore, we live for God and others. So has a relationship with Jesus Christ changed your life? You see, we're in a continual state of change. That's why one of Calvary's core values is change. Because if you're a follower of Christ, change is going to happen. 
it's always happening. We're always growing, always developing, always becoming different than what we were before through that relationship with Christ. And some of you are going, God, you've dropped so much on us, I don't even know where to start. Here's a great place to start. Life groups. We have sign-ups at the tables right outside the front doors out here. If you're not involved with a small group of believers that you're meeting with during the week so that you can grow in Christ, go sign up. Because if you want to grow in Christ, if you want to have that life-changing relationship change you more and more, that happens best in the context of living life with other believers. And so go sign up for a life group if you haven't done so. So we respond to Jesus, and when we do that, our lives change because we begin to live out his mission. We begin to live out his mission. Well, what is his mission? The, the end of this passage is his mission. Verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Seek and save the lost. Now, the lost are people who don't know Christ, who do not have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's what it means when it says the lost. Christ's mission for us, Jesus' mission for us is to seek and lead them to salvation in Jesus Christ. That should be our mission. That should be what we live for. So here's my question. I'm not asking you to memorize the four spiritual laws of the Roman road, because half of you in this room don't even know what those things are. And that's not a problem. That's okay. I'm not asking you to be spiritually wise in all things. I'm not asking you to memorize your Bible, although knowing your Bible better will help you in your walk with Christ. What I'm asking you to do is very simple. Invite your friends to church. It doesn't have to be this church. It doesn't have to be whatever. Invite them to come and hear the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. You don't know what to tell them? Fine. Let us do the work for you. Get them in the doors. It doesn't have to be here. It doesn't have to. Just get them to church. Get them somewhere where they're going to hear about the salvation of Jesus Christ about a life-changing relationship with the one that can save them. That's Jesus' mission. And that brings us to a very difficult challenge in this mission that uh, this account of Zacchaeus actually brings to light. And I call it this, the they attitude. The they attitude. That's your, your next blank, the they attitude. And it's simply this, who are your they's? Do you know what I mean by that? Who are the people that you look at and you go, oh, them. They do that. I don't do that. They do that. Right? All of us, I don't care how good a person you are. I don't care how loving a person that you are. Every single one of us in this room have people that we look at in our lives that we go, oh, them. (laughs) They I'm not one of them, no. I'm over here. We all have a they attitude towards somebody. And so here, let me help you figure out who your they's are. Some of you already figured it out. But who are your they's? Let me throw this out at you. Take this account of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' life, this life change that takes place, who do you most identify with in this account? Is it the religious leaders who are kind of being down on Zacchaeus and then they're down on Jesus for Jesus asking to go to uh, Zacchaeus' house? Are you one of the onlookers who's like, oh my goodness, look at the life change in Zacchaeus' life. Are you you one of the guys on the sideline who's just going, "Uh, I don't know what's going on here. It's kind of cool, but I have no clue what's going on. Because we, all, we can all probably identify with someone in this account. I'll be very honest with you. I'm, I identify most with the religious guys. The guys that are condemned by Jesus the most, that's who I struggle not to be. Because if I go to my default, I'm a cynical, judgmental, questioning what God does kind of guy. That's what I do. And it's not something that I like to admit. It's not something that I like about myself, but that's... That's what I struggle with. I struggle with looking at situations that God's doing some great things and going, yeah, I don't think that's really happening. 
Yeah, we'll see if that really lasts. That's, that's what I struggle not to do all the time. But who are you? In this account, who do you identify with most? You know, Jesus' theys, as I mentioned, were the religious leaders. And I struggle very hard not to have that attitude, that they attitude that the religious leaders had. But how do we as a people avoid having the wrong theys in our life? How do we avoid categorizing people in those they ways? Well, it's very simple. We view people as people. If you don't want to be the guy or the girl that has the wrong attitude towards people, you categorize people into they's too much, then you need to view people simply as people. View them through the lens that Jesus Christ views them through. Let me give you an example. In Mark 12, kind of towards the end, about two-thirds of the way through Mark 12, uh, a religious scribe comes to Jesus and says, what's the greatest commandment out there? And Jesus says, there's two of them. The first one is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But guys, we've gotten really bad at loving our neighbor as ourselves, haven't we? If we were to take all the commands and say the American people in general are worst at this command, this one would be the one that we would point out, that we are not very good at loving our neighbors. You see, we're supposed to love everyone. Well, what if I don't like the person? Or what if that other person doesn't like me? I don't care. If you go into Matthew chapter 5, towards the end, it says, uh, love and pray for your enemies and those who persecute you. Jesus commands us to love the people that hate us or that we hate. We're supposed to love people. But guys, let's be honest. And Chad called this out a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to do it again because I haven't seen a whole lot of change on Facebook lately. The fact is, is we live in a politically fired up world, don't we? I mean, it's all about how much we hate that other politician or people who support that other politician. Guys, I don't care who you're for or who you're against. That is a person that God loves. Quit hating every person that has different views than you. That is a sin. It is something that God is calling us to stop. Why do you think there's so much hate in America today? Why do you think that there's so much division? Why do you think that there's constantly this back and forth of that group and this group and this, that, and that, the other? Because we in this room are hating too many people. We have to stop. And we have to understand that we're commanded to love our neighbors even if they hate us. Do you want me to start calling you out on Facebook when you put a hateful post up about a politician? Because, guys, we're all doing it. I did it like six months ago, and luckily a church member called me out on it. Guys, we've got to stop. We've got to be the loving hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world because I'll be very frank with you, we're not doing a very good job of that. How many people do you think are coming to know Christ because that hateful political post you put up two days ago? Zero. As a matter of fact, you haven't led people to Christ, you've pushed people away from Christ. So the next time you go to talk about politics or put something on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, The first question you should be asking is, am I loving my neighbor by putting up this post? Because if I'm not, then I don't need to post it. Because that's the second most important command according to Jesus. We have to stop with the hate. But we do this in other areas as well. We do this in our marriages, don't we? We live with someone long enough, and we stop loving that person as much as we did. We stop seeing them as a person. Remember I said view people as people. We stop seeing our spouse as a person. And we start seeing them as an object, just a means to an end. If you're in that boat, come talk to us. Read God's word on what it says about being a loving husband and a loving wife. Ephesians 5. Do what God calls you to do in your marriage. What about our kids? Do we view our kids as people or do we view them as objects that we just got to tolerate until they turn 18 and get out of the house? I hate to say it, but that's the way a lot of people view their kids. 
your kids, as much as they irritate the dog out of you, your kids are people that God loves. They have dreams, they have aspirations, they have desires in their lives, and you're called to love your children. What about, mar- or what about work, your coworkers? That's a hard one, because a lot of coworkers that we work with um, don't especially love Jesus and make fun of us for it. I mean, I work in a church, and that happens. Oh, no way, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> but even if our coworkers hate Jesus, we're called to love them. Here's the hardest one, and I'll close with this. What about people in the church? How many of us dislike someone in the church because they <laughs> whatever? Guys, we're called to love one another above all. There's a brotherly love that we're commanded to um, over and over in God's word. And guys, we don't even do a good job of that. So what did I tell you tonight? What was the point? The first thing is understand that salvation changes your life. And if your life isn't changed, then come talk to us. Let us help you walk, you walk you into some of that change, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And the next thing is love people. View people as people. Stop hating. Stop hurting. Start loving. Join me in prayer.